All right. Most of the coverage that I've done thus far of the Ukraine situation has been relegated primarily to the live stream, which means that not much of it has been put on the actual YouTube channel, which is unfortunate because most of the people who watch me watch me through the YouTube videos. I want to talk very briefly about what has happened so that everyone who doesn't watch my live streams can be caught up in a uh, fairly pointed manner, okay? So, <clears throat> basically, here is the situation, all right? I'm going to catch you up with the broadest possible strokes, just in case anyone hasn't been following all the developing information. There's a lot of nuance to this that I can't go over in detail, at least not for this little bit. You really should be watching the streams here. Um, first of all, uh, Ukraine is a country, used to be part of the USSR. Now, it isn't the part of the USSR. Russia has, for a long time, considered it kind of, sort of, you know, Russia... Russian territory. Um, there have been numerous political problems uh, which have drawn as a product of that, but this became most notable when after the ousting of an autocratic and uh, uh, pro-Putin leader in Ukraine uh, in 2014, um, Russia began to fund Russian separatists in a portion of the Donbass region. Uh, the Donbass region uh, uh, describes the um, Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, these provinces on the eastern side of the country, uh, e about here. Um, now, obviously, because Russia is all the way over here, you know, to the east, the people on the eastern side of Ukraine are, um, well, more amenable to Russian influence, at least a little bit. We'll never know how amenable they actually are, because uh, Russia began to fund separatist groups in the, Do um, the Donbass region. Uh, and as a product of this, there has now been an eight-year-long proxy war between Russian-backed separatist groups. Full-on backed, by the way. Russia has given them military equipment. They have fired rockets uh, into... Um, into civilian areas in uh, in Ukraine. I mean, this is a this is a full on incursion disguised as an authentic uh, grassroots separatist movement, and that conflict has been broiling for about eight years. There have been efforts made to stabilize the conflict. Uh, the Minsk agreements are the most commonly referred to proposed diplomatic solution. There was Minsk one, and then it was so good they wanted a sequel, Minsk two. Actually, the first one was really bad. That's why they wanted the second one. Whatever the case may be, neither agreement was actually followed. It would have uh, required a degree of political autonomy for the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, which is something Russia wants, because that degree of autonomy would have allowed them greater political control over the area. But one of the preconditions for the Minsk agreements uh, to actually be followed would be both people, both groups, sorry, pulling troops out of the conflict region which Russia never did. In fact, very shortly after Minsk II passed it, uh, Russian-backed separatists took a f***ing town. They took a town. So not only after the attempts at diplomacy did Russia ignore the necessary preconditions for, um, for, for peace, they uh, uh, flew in their face entirely and full-on sieged a city. <clears throat> took it, too. Anyhow... This sort of proxy war has been going on for about eight years, up until a couple of months ago, where Russia has been building up troops at the border of Ukraine, uh, having troops in Belarus as well, bringing troops to Crimea, an area of Ukraine that was annexed in the past, E down here, essentially getting the full surround, okay? All of my RTS friends can appreciate the, uh, the, the care and strategy that has gone into Russia's almost inevitable attempt at yoinking the entirety of Ukraine. So basically, people have seen the writing on the wall for a long time now, and what people have done with this information has been incredibly revealing. A great portion of the online left has decided that Russia's decades of separatist uh, funding, their decades of pro-annexation rhetoric in their media, and their military buildup on the borders of Ukraine from all sides mean nothing and that it's all just a huge meme. Obviously, of course, it wasn't a huge meme. Uh, because just a few days ago, the invasion actually began. Uh, Russia declared uh, that they were recognizing the independence of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. Now, by recognize the independence here, what he actually means is, I, Russia, am now declaring that a portion of Ukraine is not actually Ukraine. <clears throat> you, uh, you can't actually do that. That's not actually a thing you can do. Uh, you, you can't actually do that. 
But of course, now that in the Russian pretext, this is no longer a part of Ukraine, he immediately sent troops into that portion of the Donbass um, to, you know, defend them. One of the central claims in Russian propaganda is that the Donbass region is uh, going to be genocided by Kyiv, by the actual Ukrainian capital, and that Russia's involvement there is a defensive measure to protect the innocent Russian-speaking citizens in that portion of Ukraine. Now, there's no evidence of a genocide ramping up. There has historically been some degree of discrimination against the people in this portion of Ukraine, and that is reprehensible on the part of Ukraine's government. I will not defend it. However, the claims of a full-on genocide have never been substantiated. But of course, Russia doesn't care. They march troops into the Donbass region, um, <clears throat> saying that, uh, you know, they're here to protect people. And here's the thing, okay? <clears throat> God help me. The area um, that separatists control in East Ukraine is about yay big. Uh, this is not a good uh, map drawing of what area they control. Just work with me here, okay? It's about yay big, okay? Russian separatists are all up in here, okay? Here's the issue. The area that Russia declared was independent is about yay big. Which means that all along this border right here are Ukrainian armed forces. So when Russia moves in to defend the independent provinces of Duha, um, <clears throat> Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, what happens when we encounter Ukrainian armed forces? Well, my guess was that Russia was going to use the separatist-controlled territory as a staging ground, and then when the time was right, they were going to begin shelling Ukraine, bombs, missiles, rockets, artillery, from every possible direction. Because we know they have artillery all over here, all over the place, and a superior air force. We know they have troops built up in Crimea, we know they control the Sea of Azov, they can come in from every possible angle, except basically for Poland. Here's, here's the one safe zone, and even that's not really that safe. You understand? Now, I actually ended up being wrong here. Russia ended up being more aggressive than I expected them to. Rather than using the separatist-controlled region as a staging ground while softening up Ukraine with artillery and missile fire, uh, they just decided to do the invasion full on. Just, we have reports of Russian troops moving in from everywhere, basically, and we have uh, rocket attacks, missile strikes, and Russian planes flying over pretty much all of Ukraine. Uh, they've bombed the capital already. They sent uh, troops and, uh, uh, to try to take the airport outside Kyiv. Though, as I understand it, currently, at least most recently, the Ukrainian armed forces claims they've reclaimed the airport outside Kyiv. That would be nice. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll update you guys on that shortly. Um, Basically, this is a this is a full on invasion, just a full on 100 percent. We are seizing the entirety of the territory invasion. That was a mistake, Vosh. They corrected it. No news is good news. So <clears throat> here's the position that we're at right now. The most recent information that I have is that they've taken Chernobyl. So soon Russia will unleash all of the mutagenic horrors that uh, Ukraine has spent the past, uh, you know, uh, decades uh, 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 cramming down into the, the you know, the dungeons beneath Chernobyl. So we'll see how that goes. Um, in terms of the state of the actual war effort in Ukraine presently, this is my impression for what is going to happen moving forward, okay? And my, my interpretation of events thus far, okay? Russia's behavior here seems to indicate a level of desperation that exceeds the level of desperation I thought they were acting on. Everything Russia has done reeks of desperation. What they're doing right now is attempting essentially a blitzkrieg. Uh, they are attempting to rapidly and as painlessly as possible demoralize the Ukrainian people with a, a strike across the breadth of the country, cut off everything, destroy everything, you know, the last thing they want is a prolonged occupation because that would go very poorly for them. I do not think they have the capacity for this blitzkrieg to succeed. Uh, recently, the top general of Ukraine has claimed that their day one blitzkrieg has failed. Um, I hope this continues to be the case because the longer this drags out, the better things are going to go for Ukraine. As America has learned many times over, um, Dest uh, destroying territory is easy. Defeating armies on the field, that's easy. Occupying territory is hard, incredibly difficult, overwhelmingly difficult. 
America has the strongest military on Earth, and we can't do it particularly well. Russia's military is not up to snuff compared to ours, and Ukraine is a thousand times more defensible than Afghanistan was. Ukraine has far more mobilized troops, far more equipment, far more armor, far more soldiers, far more training than Afghanistan did. And Russia's military is not ours. The longer an occupation gets dragged out, the worse this is going to be for Russia. And they have every reason to expedite this process as quickly as they can because their stock market... <laughs> their stock market has... Um, <clears throat> has taken note of their behavior. Uh, as it turns out, it's really, really bad for the global economy to be a warmongering fascist tyrant. Um, their stocks have plummeted. This is actually one of the um, worst stock crashes, as I understand it, can anyone correct me on this, in all of recorded history. One of the worst in all of recorded history. Uh, a, a drop of around, I think, 30 to 40 percent um, in, the, in the Russian ruble-based stock market, the, o, uh, the MOEX. <clears throat> Which is, uh, you know, um, <laughs> which is spectacular. Let me see if I can get MMAX, uh Russian Index 2022 data. Get me that line. I want to see line go down, okay? Oh, yeah. That's what I like to see, folks. Oh, that is just... <sighs> woo! That is just beautiful. That is what I like to see. Oh, look. Oh, my... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Look at the red. Sell, 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 sell. Um... The, uh, uh, the Kremlin has already made efforts to prevent the freefall of their stock market by doing several market freezes, but there's only so much you can do. This is what I mean, by the way, about a global economy being the best way of preventing um, uh, uh, aggressive military action between countries that have trade interdependence. Um, you know, uh, Russia, Russia's economy is pretty goddamn dependent on countries that do not want it to do invasions, uh, no matter how much they distance themselves from that. It's, 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 it is a difficult problem to overcome, and uh, they are going to suffer tremendously for it. And I hope they do. Uh, they, need to, uh, they need to bear the brunt of the consequences. Uh, it is absolutely necessary that they do so. Uh, anyway, I just want to talk about how the war effort will progress from this point forward. So there are basically three directions that this can take, okay? The first one is the hopelessly optimistic one, where Russia realizes they're in over their head and they, they, they pull back. This is, this, this is ridiculous. This would be a ridiculous, uh, th th ridiculous level of hopium. Uh, unfathomable, almost. The idea that this government would, would, like, would do that. No, I don't think so. Barely even worth discussing, but it's not impossible, so there you go. The second possibility, the one that I think is most likely, is that um, Russia is going to continue this war of incredible aggression with more and more prolonged anti-civilian bombing runs, uh, going to try and occupy as much territory as possible and bleed his empire dry in the process. Um, the third option is the one which actually works out in favor of Russia, one which is still not tremendously to their favor, but they do succeed in effectively pacifying the region. My guess is that the second option is most likely by far. This is going to be a horrendously destructive conflict, and I feel as though there's very little we can do right now except as people who are presumably in the West, I know some Ukrainians are watching right now, I am not Ukrainian, tragically, uh, you know, Ukrainian in spirit, Polish, Irish, and blood. Um, as people who are watching, the best thing we can do is attempt to facilitate a positive, um, a, a, a positive political environment for the support of Ukrainian people. So that is what we need to focus on. Uh, 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 but in the meantime, as I speak right now, moment to moment, as I draw breath, uh, people are fighting and dying in Ukraine. There are soldiers exchanging fire right now with Russian intruders into their country. So all support to them as much as we can.